I used to write to states and have them send me the maps from their states and I'd hang them on my walls. And I would picture people inside the maps and I would picture these elaborate cities. So I probably was slightly delusional when I shared this with my friends that I wanted to do this. So when I finally saw the movie The Sixth Sense, I realized I had uh, something I could relate to when it came to Cole Sear because I also saw things that didn't exist. But in this case, it wasn't dead people. It was data, either imagined or real, but it was data that was very important to me. My journey started with my doctor four years ago who forgot my test results, and I kind of got upset. So I started feverishly, feverishly logging everything I did when I went to see him. Finally, today when I go to see him, he's just like, why are you even here? You can just tell me what's wrong with yourself. Two years ago, I started incorporating as many devices, sensors, applications, and services as I could into my life. Currently, I have over 300 systems that simultaneously monitor everything I do, whether it be my home, my work, or my play. I realized that all of a sudden, all of this data was taking on a very unique pattern. It was starting to overlay each other, much like a top topographical map. So pictures became not just photographs, but they became data experiences. And I realized that my life's journey was actually being measured. It was when I saw Amber Case at South by Southwest in 2012 that I realized what I was kind of serendipitously doing was something called surveillance. So I was observing the observer and collecting as much data as I could, but it was getting to be quite exhausting doing this. Because if I looked at the services I was using, there were hundreds of them, and nobody should have to go through this many screens to figure out what's important to you. This is a form of slavery that we need to get, figure out how to get out of. So I wanted to fix that. I wanted to move away from this very uh, old system. And then I saw Aaron P.K. present <laughs> at Cyborg Camp last November, and he introduced me to the concept of low friction data collection. And I thought, oh my gosh, I have a word for it. I'm not, okay, I am crazy, but I have a word for it. So I, I started looking at all these systems. The first thing I did was every single piece of data I c collect gets protected. So it gets locked away in a web-based system in a text format. So it doesn't matter if it's the lights or the dogs or the truck, it gets locked away and protected so that I can search it and find information later on. The next thing I do is every piece of data, again, whether it's the food I'm eating or the exercise, all goes into spreadsheets. So simultaneously, I collect it and then I reflect it back into a spreadsheet so I can do charts and graphs on it. Probably the most compelling thing that people know me for is I then wanted to visualize it. So my entire day is monitored in my Google Calendar. The colors represent the different types of life streams that actually happen within any given day. So like I said, at any given time, three or 400 different things are happening to me simultaneously and they're low frictionally logged in the back. So I created a data Maslow hierarchy of needs. So I could toggle my calendar on and off to see where I was actually doing well in my life and where my life was actually struggling. And I could start to focus goals on those areas by using the visual representation and the calendaring. But then just like Cole, I needed some more help. So I didn't have a, a doctor who was also slightly crazy, uh, but I did have other tools. And one of those tools were going back to my childhood and realizing what maps meant to me. Because if I looked at maps, I noticed that they had layers of information. So I broke down my types of uh, services I was using, every single application, every single service, every single device, every single sensor, and looked for ways that I could get the information out of them as easily as possible, which was no easy feat. Everything from Yahoo Pipes to RSS feeds to fake Twitter accounts that share stuff to bogus accounts that can be picked up to APIs to if to Zapier. I am like a hack, you know, I, I'm a hack on crack. Uh, so I, I just can't get enough of this stuff, and I think it's a shame that we don't make it more available to ourselves and each other. What was really profound for me was I realized that all of these data points actually created a platform for existence. So I could actually use almost a tic-tac-toe board to make things trigger in my life in response to the data around me. So my world became very interesting when I started doing that. I started using things like do-it-yourself recipes, ambient light recipes, noise recipes by BioBeats to create music from my data, and even professional lighting recipes. Uh, so the more information I could get, the better. But just like in the movie The Sixth Sense, whenever you see the color red, you know that you're having a brush with the undead world. I also noticed that there were signals when I was having brushes with profound data moments in my, in my personal life. The, probably the most profound data moment I had was when I realized that I could manipulate the environment around me based on the data that I was generating. Because I think this is a way that we can solve one of the major economic problems we're about to face, and that's the tremendous amount of people my age who are underemployed or unemployed. The next thing I found was by layering these uh, uh, pieces of data together, as Aaron said, you know, my food plus my activity isn't enough. I need my food, my activity, and my spending all in one picture. 
So I need to see that together so that I can understand those patterns. It's really the cheaper food that makes me fat, not the, how much of it that I eat. Then I noticed really crazy things. So watching Project Runway, two episodes in a row, actually makes me eat worse the second or third day. Um, uh, air quality sensors in my home actually trigger really bad sleepless nights when my uh, cleaning people come. I've lost 70 pounds, not 65. Thank you uh, for the extra five pounds this week. Um, but that's really come from behaviors, not in food or exercise, but environmental conditioning using the data from my life. Um, if my house is a certain temperature and humidity, I actually drive my truck much worse. So I accelerate faster and brake faster. So again, having the data available to you so that you can see them together makes a huge difference, and, I, and I'm hoping we can do this. Probably the most profound thing, I think, is my data being collected is one thing, but my data having a relationship with itself is another. So the systems within my life start to speak to each other, and I can now pick up those systems as they start to have conversations, which kind of moves this kind of weird theory in my mind. The other thing I learned was over the last nine months after I kind of came out of my data closet at Cyborg Camp, people are profoundly interested in this. Everybody wants to talk to me, and all I really did was exploit the world around me and make use of it in some tangible way. The dark side of all this is I'm fortunate, so I have tremendous resources when it comes to time and financial and, and just brain power, and I know smart people. And I'm afraid that we're entering an age of almost a data elysium, where if we're not very careful, we're going to end up with the haves and have-nots. And for me, that's really important that we avoid this kind of alternate reality where only special people get access to data and only special people can understand data because I'm not special, I'm just like you. And then finally, uh, my dogs have always been like the cornerstone of my life. Rocco is someone I love and care for very much. And being able to see that my Rocco and my home and my truck and, my, and the devices in my home and even you know, things around my house all have a relationship with each other gave me a profound awakening that I have never experienced any level of spirituality in anything I've explored. I understand now that I am connected to everything and everything is connected to me. It just needs to be collected. It means a lot for me to be here. Last year I sat in the audience and I was just overwhelmed by everyone that I met. And all the experiences I've had since then uh, have led to this day. And I just really, I don't have anything really profound to say at the end, but thank you so much for this community. Thank you to Gary and the conference. Without you, I wouldn't have been able to have a relationship with myself. Thank you. I noticed um, two pretty novel results in your um, talk, and I wanted you to talk about them more. You said that watching Project Runway two days, you said, this, what you said was, watching Project Runway two days in a row made your weight go down. And what no, your slide it, it, said it up, yeah. was it made it go up. Yeah. So did it make it go up or down? It makes it go up, and sorry about the difference. Yeah, yeah. I'm just trying to keep up with this momentum. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, actually what I found was my movement and my uh, food uh, and what I was consuming had a lot to do with my weight fluctuations, but actually what I consumed via audio or video actually had more of a relationship to how poorly I ate the next day. So why do you think? What did you think about? Well, like I think what? Heidi Klum is really dangerous. I think you should avoid her. Um, but there's something about time shifting media. So when you time shift media, you could, could, if you travel or you don't have a lot to watch your favorite show, if you time shift media, there's something about watching a lot of the same type of junk. So it's a massive amount of junk in the brain. And I think that just chemically does something to me. I'm not so it's the actual watching the media, not necessarily, in your, your hypothesis is, it's the, it's the kind of uh, media binge, not the actual content. That just happens to be your favorite show. Well, or well no, Heidi, you know, it's just that particular show is the worst. It doesn't happen on CNN or Anderson Cooper. That's interesting. I mean, that's, I find that interesting. I, I, okay, the other one was, um, was that the temperature in your house was related mm -hmm. to how fast you drove your car. Yeah. So say something about that. That's a very novel result. I'm yeah. sure that's never been reported in any QS. Time. Yeah, so basically, as soon as I got my automatic, I put it plugged into my truck, and it keeps track of hard brakes and accelerations and all sorts of things. And I'm always driving with the dogs, so I didn't want the dogs to freak out. So I really wanted to be able to measure what the truck was doing and how I was doing. But what I noticed was there were times when the dogs weren't with me when I was driving just really aggressively, and I couldn't figure out what it was. But because we also track the temperature in the house with our Nest device and the humidity, I thought, is there a correlation to it? And the weather's been crazy in Denver the past three months. 
So basically, I started saying, and my partner loves to adjust the thermometer. So I was saying, is there a relationship to this? And sure enough, whenever he would turn the temperature up to 72, I always drove worse on days where the temperature was... Is that was because you're, you're mad? Or? I have no idea. No, because yeah, it's yeah. not uncomfortable, but it's a very subtle difference. I, huh. I can't pin it to TV or food or anything else, but right. the temperature in the house affects my driving more than huh. actually being on a bad phone call. Interesting. Okay, so let's, let's have, we have time for a few questions, if you have some. Yes? Yeah, so what I, I've actually practiced environmental conditioning. So now what I need to do is so something I have to create on a specific time frame. I actually precondition the house, the music, the lighting, and the temperature to actually get the work done because I know what environmental settings optimize my routines. Are you tracking your animals? Yes, Rocco and Lourdes are also tracked. So I actually use lighting and sound to actually make sure they stay active. Yeah. <laughs> okay, are there any other questions for, for Chris? That's just really a fantastic talk, Chris. Thank you so much. Thank you so yeah. much.